Mitsuo Fujita was a pilot in uh, a part of Imperial Japan. And at the end of the war, he was on his way into a courtroom to testify uh, regarding war crimes that the Empire of Japan had uh, committed during World War II. And Fujita would know because he was the ace of the Imperial Navy. He was the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. This man was uh, ardently committed uh, to Imperial Japan. He believed in the samurai code, which was called Bushido, and he was all about it. He believed in dying for, for honor and for his country. And he believed that the allies were simping, simply rubbing it in their faces that they had won the war. And he was going to testify that things weren't really as bad as they had been told. And on his way into the courtroom, he actually ran into a fellow pilot who he thought had died uh, over the Pacific Ocean. Turns out he had just been captured. And so we asked his friend, he said, tell me all the terrible things that the Americans did to you so that I can talk about it. And he said, that's not what happened at all. He said, they loved me, they cared for me, they nourished me, uh, they, they, they fed me well, uh, they took care of any illnesses I had, it was very comfortable, they didn't treat me badly at all. And in fact, I received the greatest love I have ever known from one of the nurses there, one of the women that took care of me, and it didn't make any sense because her parents were killed in the Philippines as they were missionaries when the Imperial uh, Army took over. And Fushida was blown away. Because in the code of Bushido, if someone killed your parents, you did not rest until you killed them back. He didn't know what this was. He didn't understand what this meant. He spent time trying to figure out uh, what in the world would change somebody? Why would you be so forgiving? Why would you be so compassionate? Why would you be so kind? And of course, you probably see where this is going. He found a Bible, he read it, and this man who had spent his entire life growing up under this code of honor, the Empire of Japan, Bushido, gave his life to Christ, and he became a pastor. And he became a minister, an evangelist. He actually has written some books. Uh, he's since passed away, but he's written some books. Uh, one of them, I think, is called God's Samurai of the Sky, which is a pretty great title. Um, I don't think anybody's going to write that about me, but that would be pretty cool. Um, you can if you want to. This man was passionate. He was zealous about the empire of Japan, about the way of life that he had been raised to follow. And just like that, he gave it up. Gave it up. He was wrong about his lifestyle. That's what happened. He realized that the code that he was following, the way his life was going was wrong, was erroneous. And so he changed his life. God called him to himself. What if there are things in your life and in my life that we're wrong about? And just like Fushida, believe it passionately, we argue about it, we fight about it. But what if we're wrong? What if we're mistaken? What if there are things that entrap us that we don't realize that they do. And what I want us to talk about today is how the, our response to the gospel, how when we obey the gospel, it can set us free. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. And this is going to be uh, one of the first sermons we do in our series on Galatians. We're going to cover the whole book and really ask the question, what does the gospel set us free to do? First, the gospel sets us free to obey. The gospel sets us free to obey. Verse 11 of chapter 1, for I would have, no, have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's writing to a group of churches in a region in modern day Turkey called Galatia, and it's a pretty large region, and it's largely made up of people who used to be uh, pagans, Gentiles, and now they're a part of the church. And what has happened is some people have come up from Jerusalem, some teachers, some men, and they are what we call now the Judaizers. That's not what they called themselves. That would have been a really weird thing to name yourself, but that's what we call them now. And they had come up into these churches, and they were going back over the churches that Paul had planted and basically telling people, you can't become a Christian until you first become a Jew. You have to convert to Judaism. And so that means that you have to, guys, you've got to get circumcised. I don't know what that meant for the ladies, but then you could become a Christian. And Paul finds out about this and he's writing to them and he's saying, look, 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 that's not the truth. That's not the case. That's not the gospel you've learned. That's not what you should be doing. They're teaching you wrongly. That's not the gospel. And it makes sense why Galatia would believe these people. 
They're from a pagan background. They don't know the Old Testament. They don't know the gospel. I mean, they know the gospel. They don't know the Bible that well. And so when, when people were coming up from Jerusalem, this is where Jesus lived and worked. This is where, where he was crucified. This is where the church started. Of course we should believe these guys. These guys have credentials. We don't. And Paul's trying to defend his ministry. He's defending the gospel that he preached to them. And he's saying, please do not do this. Because what the Judaizers were doing is they were appealing to tradition. And in the ancient world, in our, in our day and age, we always want to go after the newest, the biggest, the brightest, right? The, whatever's the most modern thing, that's the best idea, right? In ancient culture, it was just the opposite. If you had a long-standing idea, the way that you tested the validity of something was if it lasted a long time. And so what the Judaizers were doing, they were coming in, they were saying, look at all this, what we've done for, for millennia, thousands of years, we've done this, you should do it too, you shouldn't just throw it out. And Paul's saying, that is man-made, that is man-given. I received my revelation directly from Jesus Christ. I received the gospel from Jesus Christ, and you should follow it. Now, I don't know exactly how Paul received this revelation. Uh, it could be that Jesus appeared to him just like he appeared to him on the Damascus Road and imparted knowledge to him that way. Uh, it could be that uh, he just kind of miraculously opened up his brain and not like physically, but spiritually opened up his brain and just poured all this information in. It could be that over the course of three years, Jesus was right there with him, not, I wouldn't say like physically, but just spiritually leading him. Uh, we don't really know how it worked, but we know that Paul had maybe some kind of a vision or something, and he's received this information from Jesus. And he's saying that you should follow this gospel that you heard from me because I got it from Jesus. They didn't get theirs from him. And this is something that we need to be aware of. Every single one of us today, we all have some kind of worldview, some kind of understanding of the way the world works that we submit our lives to. Every single one of us. Maybe it's a progressive worldview, and we think that as long as things are changing, then things are good. There's progress being made. We're, we're moving forward. Some of us are just the opposite. We're conservative. The only change we want is what's in our pockets, and we want things to stay the same. And when things stay the same, then we're happy. Then we're contented. Then we're secure. Others of us, we want to be happy. We want pleasure, and so it's a hedonistic kind of thing. We want to be uh, as long as we're happy, everything's good. Or maybe we want to please people, or we want to please our parents, or we want to live in a way so that we can look ourselves in the mirror. For Paul, his was to follow the traditions of the Pharisees. And we'll get into that in a second. For Metsuo Fushida, it was to follow Bushido. It was to follow the Samurai Code, the Empire of Japan. That's what his lifestyle was. If the Empire was doing well, it didn't matter. If he died in a fiery plane crash, it didn't matter at all. All that mattered was that the Empire of Japan, that the Emperor was honored. That was his worldview. And whether you know it or not, you have a, a worldview, a system, an understanding that's not the gospel that you submit your life to, that you obey, that you follow. And what's more is you evangelize it. You argue with people about it. You get in fights about it. You try to convince your opponents. You talk to your friends about it. You disciple and raise your kids in it. And it's a man-made gospel. It's not from Christ. It's made with human hands. It was handed down to you, maybe by your parents and your grandparents, maybe a mentor or a friend imparted it to you, but that is what you live your life by. And Paul stopped preaching a man's gospel. He decided through the power of the Spirit that he was going to follow Christ and that he was going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's going to stop trying to win other people's favor, win their opinion, honor his traditions. Paul left that gospel behind. And instead, he embraced a gospel of grace, one of unmerited favor. God extended a hand to him and said, if you follow me, I will love you unconditionally. And Paul took him up on it. How could you not? How could you not? Because this is what obedience to the gospel is. Obedience to the gospel is not like obedience to any other system. Because in other systems, they demand something of you, right? They want something from you. If you are, say, working out, 
maybe is a good example, right? You're working out, you want to you be fit physically, and so you submit yourself to this lifestyle of healthy living. You have to give up a lot of things to be able to consider yourself in top physical form, right? You've got to eat only certain foods, never anything fatty, you have no french fries, which why would anybody do this? You've got to work out consistently. It's a lifestyle, it's a worldview that you submit yourself to, and it costs something. If you want to be the best parent, it costs something. It costs a lot of money. But not just that, it costs time, it costs heartache, it costs pain. If you want to climb the ladder at your job or in your career, it costs something. I heard uh, somebody talk about uh, Tiger Woods one time. It was right in the middle of, of his, his car wreck and uh, his subsequent divorce and all that stuff. And, and um, they were talking about how we all get so surprised when these people that are such great athletes or such great celebrities, people who have devoted their entire lives to this one thing, we get so surprised when we find out they're not good at anything else. Like they, they don't know how to be a parent. They don't know how to be, how to be a, a, a husband or a wife. They don't know how to function in society because they spent their entire life mastering the art of hitting a ball this size as far as they could. And we're so surprised about it. If you are going to be that kind of person. If you're going to submit yourself to that lifestyle, it costs something. If you're going to follow Jesus, it costs something too. Jesus comes to you and he says, here's what I want from you. I want your brokenness. I want your sin. I want your failure. You bring that to me. You bring to me the things you're not proud of. That's what I want from you. I want the things you're embarrassed of, the things you've never told anybody else. That's what I want. And what you do is you take that to Christ. You say, Jesus, I can't fix this. I can't make this right. I can't be healed from this apart from you. And I'm trusting you through your death, your burial, and your resurrection in a way that I don't really understand. I'm trusting you to fix this and to make me whole. And it might take a lifetime to do it, but I'm submitting my life to you. That's what the response to the gospel is. That's what the response to grace is. It's not earning it. It's not getting God to be happy with you. Responding to the gospel is to give God your brokenness and trust Jesus Christ with it. And then from there, are there things that you'd obey? Yes, of course. But that's how it starts. That's how you follow Christ, is by regularly bringing him the things, bringing him everything, really, but making sure you bring him the things that you're embarrassed of, you're not proud of. That's how you obey the gospel. And when you obey the gospel, it sets you free in other ways. It sets you free in another way, which is this. It sets you free uh, to let go. It sets you free to let go. And really, it sets you free to let go of, in, in really two ways that Paul talks about here. One, it sets you free to let go of your past. Let go of your past. Look at verse 13. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God violently and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Paul talks about his past. Paul wasn't just on the path to being a good Pharisee. No, 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 no. He was on the path to being the best Pharisee ever. He was the benchmark upon which they measured all the other. He was, he like had a class of like other young Pharisees, and he was getting farther beyond them. He was incredibly zealous. Again, just like Mitsuo Fujita was incredibly zealous. They're the same person. Fujita is a modern day Paul. Same person. That's why Paul persecuted the church. That's why he, he did not want anyone to deviate from the system, the traditions that he had. And that's the biggest thing he talks about. He talks about the traditions of his father. Phariseeism was obsessed with these traditions that were handed down from generation to generation. And Paul would look back in the past and he would look for his examples. He would look for his role model. He would look after like Phineas uh, from Numbers. If you don't know who Phineas is, you should read his story. It's pretty cool. Uh, Phineas basically uh, skewers a person uh, for violating what God was commanding them to do. And God applauds him. He's like, yes, that's what I want. That's zeal for my name. Elijah, after the prophets of Baal failed to get Baal to do anything, because, spoilers, Baal's not real, he kills them all. And God's like, yes. And so Paul looks back at this and he's like, okay. 
If I want to be like the, my heroes, that means I persecute. That's mean, that means I go after people that are not following Yahweh. And that's why he went after the church. His zeal for the traditions are what drove him to persecute. Fushida's zeal for the empire of Japan drove him to drop bombs on Pearl Harbor. Now, let's be clear about one thing. Traditions are not bad. I love traditions. Society loves traditions. The reason why when you get in a car wreck and it's somebody else's fault and you don't have to fight them to the death to get them to pay for the car is because we have a tradition of law in our society. Rather than fighting people and taking their stuff, there's a legal means in which you can acquire those things if they are owed to you. It's a tradition of law. It's a good thing. Traditions are not bad. They're not bad at all. And everybody in this room likes traditions as well. It's when traditionalism becomes the thing. It's when we say, this is how we worship God. This is the only way we worship God. This is the best way to do things, and we're never going to do anything differently, which I know what everybody in this room is thinking. You are all thinking, well, man, that sanctuary service needs to hear this message. <laughs> Guess what? This service has been around for almost 20 years, long enough for traditionalism to set in. Let me ask you this. What if I were to tell you that moving forward, we're getting rid of the guitars, and we're just going to be more of a hip-hop service. Some of you are like, yeah, that sounds cool. And the rest of you are like, gee, I don't know. Hip-hop sounds dangerous. You would hate it, many of you, because you like this style of worship. This is even, it's contemporary, but there's stuff that's even more contemporary than this. And you're like, I don't know. What's a djembe? What if I were to tell you from now on that rather than just preaching 30 minutes, I'm going 45 or an hour? What's funny is nobody laughed about that in the other service either. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> you don't push me, I'll do it. Just keep going. Traditionalism is largely made of three things. One, it's a good idea. Nobody gets traditional about bad ideas, for the most part. Usually it worked at a time, it was functional at a time. It's a good idea. It starts out with a good idea. And then you add time. A good idea over time becomes a tradition. And sometimes it stays a good idea. Sometimes it becomes an okay idea. Sometimes it's just like, nah, but it works. It's a good idea plus time. When you get traditionalism, there's a third ingredient, and it's fear. It's fear. Traditionalism sets in when we don't understand the world outside, and it scares us. And so we try to go back to the way things always were. Things were better, things were happier then, so let's just keep doing things the way we've always done them here and shut out the rest of the world. Or, or when we don't understand what the Spirit of God is doing, and so we hide in our traditions. This is what happened to Paul. Paul didn't understand what uh, the Spirit of God was doing in his day. He didn't understand that Christ was the Son of God. He didn't get that yet. And so he's full of fear, and so he persecuted followers of the gospel because he didn't get it. He was afraid. And see, the gospel allows us to leave behind fear. For Fujita, that's what it allowed him to leave behind. He was able to leave behind the fear of a world without the empire of Japan, without Bushido, without the samurai code. He was going to leave that behind, and it allowed him to leave it behind. Many of our pasts are riddled with fear, and you spend your life making sure you never have to feel that again. Some of you had a bad experience in church. Guess what? Newsflash. We all have had bad experiences in church if you've been around long enough. But some of you, your response is, I never want to feel that again, and so I'll come to a big service like this, or I'll watch online, but I'm not going to go to anything where I have to know anybody because I was hurt that one time. And so you have a tradition of staying out of community. Some of you opened your Bible one time to read it. You were like, okay, the pastor's always talking about reading my Bible. I'm going to do this. And you made the unfortunate mistake of opening it to like numbers. And you were like, wow, I don't know about this. There's a lot of digits. I don't do math. It's called numbers, man. Come on. And so you just closed it up. And now you have a tradition of not reading the Bible because you're just like, mm, I don't get it. I don't get it. We have traditions of all sorts of things in our life. Maybe you have doubts about your faith. And you have this tradition. You understand faith as being uh, uh, ignorant. Your faith and ignorant, faith and ignorance go together. And so I can't ask the questions that I have in my life. So you have a tradition of just being quiet. Or maybe your past is much darker than that. Maybe you have a tradition of addiction. 
You have a tradition of abuse. Maybe there's pain that's been inflicted or pain that's been received from you, by you, to you. Or maybe there's success in your past, but you're so afraid that your best days are behind you, that you've peaked. And now the only tradition you really care about is making sure that that peak keeps going for as long as possible. Maybe you've developed a tradition of protecting yourself from harm, physical, emotional, psychological, whatever it is. If you are not going to let traditionalism rule your life, you have got to give Jesus Christ your fear. And you've got to talk to him about it. You've got to address it. You've got to face it. Otherwise, traditionalism will rule your life, and you will have traditions of which you are unaware, and they will choke out the work of God in your life, not because traditions are bad, but because of what you're using a tradition for, which is to hide from the Spirit of God. Check in with Adam and Eve. Go read Genesis. Go see what hiding does. He always finds us. You need to let go of your past. You also need to let go of your present. Look at verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, I really love that verse. I'm going to read it again. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul beautifully describes this relationship with Jesus. He says, before the creation of anything, God had me picked out to be this instrument of bringing the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles. That's what my job was. That's what he created me to do. He had me picked out for it. And what's crazy is that Paul doesn't really go to anybody to get this affirmed. He just kind of takes this, which I would not recommend that necessarily for other people in their giftedness. This is like a unique Paul thing. You should very much have people speaking into your life. But in Paul's case, he doesn't do that. He goes away, he leaves, and he goes to Arabia, which I have this mental image of Paul in Arabia, like in a desert, sitting under like a palm tree with like a little hut, just like learning from Jesus somehow. I don't think that's actually what was going on. There were people in Arabia at the time. And I get this like Luke going to learn from Yoda image, just like in a desert. And that's not, I think, what was going on. But you just got a little peek inside my brain. Um, And I'm sorry, you can leave now. Um, Look, if it's me, I'm going up to Jerusalem, 100%. I just had a dramatic vision on the way to kill people, by the way. And now I don't want to kill them anymore. I want to go talk to them. And so I'm going to go see Peter, and I'm going to say, hey, dude, you spent three years with Jesus. Does this line up with your experience? Can we talk about this? And then I'm going to be like, oh, by the way, I'm this chosen instrument to the Gentiles. They may have heard about my history of violent murder, uh, can you like write a letter for me that just says, nah, he's cool now? That's what I would do. And that seems the most practical thing to do, is to get with some people, figure out what's going on, circle the wagons, and then go. That's not what Paul does. And you know why that's not what Paul does? It's not because he's super Christian. It's not because he's super zealous, although he is. It's because that's not what Jesus told him to do. Paul's present was dramatically reshaped and reshifted by the commands of Jesus Christ. If God is going to give you, if you're going to experience the liberating freedom of the gospel, you have got to let Jesus define what your present is going to be. And we are obsessed with our present condition. Obsessed with it. One of the ways that we know we're happy that we're not scared, that we're safe, and that we're secure and that we're comfortable is by evaluating our present circumstances. You're all mostly probably pretty comfortable in this room right now, right? Maybe a little cold, some of you, a little chilly. Well, I love it because I'm hot up here, okay? But for the most part, if you're cold, you what? Go put on a sweater, maybe turn up the heat, whatever. If you're hot, you turn down the air conditioning. Don't go outside. Just whatever you do, don't go outside. If you're sleepy, you take a nap. If you're hungry, you eat. If you're bored, you watch Netflix. We are obsessed with making sure that the equilibrium that we desire in our current state is maintained. We have a very specific environment that we want to have. And as sentient, free agent beings, we can actually work 
to make sure that our present condition is what we want it to be. And we spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money. And trust me, go look at your power bill at the end of the month. You will spend a lot of money making sure that you're comfortable, making sure that your current state is what you want it to be. That's fine. That's the way we're made. But when you can't have what you want, we often get irritated, frustrated, and angry. You expect me to preach for 30 minutes. If I go an hour, you will become irritated, frustrated, and angry. Why? Because that's not the present condition that you want. You want to go to lunch. Still nobody laughs about the preaching for a long time joke. It's really amazing. You're really afraid of it. I know now. The gospel allows you to let that go. Sanctification, part of it, I think, is the process of regularly evaluating your present circumstance and asking, is the reality that I'm trying to live, the reality that I'm trying to experience right now, is it the reality that Jesus Christ wants for me? Is it the present circumstance that God wants for me, or does he have a different idea in mind for, for my current circumstance? Paul, his reality was persecuting Christians. But it says that he was chosen before the foundation of the world. So even before he was born. So while he's out persecuting Christians, he has been chosen. He's been drafted to be the messenger to the Gentiles, which doesn't make sense based on his current situation. But that's not what's happened. God's reality is different than Paul's experience. And I don't know what you think your present circumstances should be. I don't know if you think you should be farther along in life, you should be married with kids, you should be uh, uh, farther along in your job, you should have saved more for retirement. Maybe you feel like you're aimless or purposeless, adrift. Maybe you feel super busy. Spend your week asking God one question. God is the reality that I experience right now, the reality that you have for me. Is my present what you want for me? Or do you have a different present in mind? And let him answer you. For some of you, you know. You already know. You're like, I don't know how to answer that question. I know the answer to that. Why are you not moving your life into the reality that God has for you? What is God telling you differently than what would normally be said? Practicality says, move in with that person. God says, don't do it. Pleasure says, sleep with that person. God says, don't do it. Security says, save all your money. And God says, give away more than you're comfortable with. Happiness says, leave your spouse. God says, stick to the vows you made all those years ago. I don't care how happy you are. God will tell you sometimes to do something that's not practical, and it doesn't make sense. It can send you to the desert for three years but it can only alter your future. The gospel can only alter your future if you give God your past and your present. Don't expect to be closer to God in 10 or 20 years from now if you're not willing to give him your past and your present. That's like wanting to go to the moon and me digging a hole. I guess eventually I would get there, but that's a long trip. This leads us to the last blessing, probably the greatest of all. The gospel sets us free to be free. Sets us free to be free. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that were in Christ. They were only hearing it saying, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. There's a lot here to uncover, but basically what happened is they have heard of Paul. And Paul's saying, look, rather than it being a barrier to my ministry, it's actually a blessing because people are rejoicing. They're giving glory to God because of the person that I used to be and the person that I am now. I didn't know about Mitsuo Fujita until this weekend I was watching a, a documentary on sea power. It's on Netflix. It's really good. And at the end of the documentary, they talked about like Fujita became a pastor. And I was like, I didn't know that. I wonder what kind of pastor. And I started reading about him. He even met the guy. Uh, somebody told me this afterwards, and I remembered that I'd read it. Uh, he met one of the pilots uh, who did Doolittle's raid, you know, where they launched uh, bombers off the aircraft carriers and 
uh, bombed Tokyo right after uh, World War, uh, right after Pearl Harbor. And uh, this man crashed and was captured and was in a POW camp, and somehow he got a Bible. And he said, this man said before he came to know Christ, that if he could ever get a hold of the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, he would slit his throat. Well, guess what? This man got a hold of a Bible in prison, became a believer, and at some point, he and Fujita met one another, and guess what they did? Spoilers, again, he did not slit his throat. They preached together. They ministered together. What an amazing God we serve. And you think there are people in your life that you can't reconcile with. You think there are people in your life you can't forgive. Things that you hold on to. Jesus sets us free so that we can be free. So that people can glorify God because of you. He sets us free to be free from sin. Sets us free to be free of the opinion of other people. From purposelessness, from defensiveness, from insecurity. The reason why you can forgive somebody like that The reason why you can forgive somebody when uh, a group of people that have killed your parents who were being missionaries, like the woman in the story of, of Mitsuo Fujita, the reason why you can do that is because of the gospel, because the gospel set you free. You see, Jesus was free. He was a free person. He was free to... Uh, uh, do whatever he wanted to do. He was free to live his life because he was the son of God. He was preexistent. He was free. And apart from creation, they existed, the, the holy trinity of God. And they're free to love one another within the trinity. But because of man's fall, Jesus laid aside that freedom that he had as the son of God. And he came to earth and he obeyed. And he's the only one that was free to obey. That's one of the annoying things about sin. Even if we want to obey, we genuinely can't apart from Christ. And Jesus, though, he was free to obey, and so he obeyed. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And then being free, again, being free to be free, to do whatever he wanted to do. And what does he do with his life? He gets pinned down. He gets nailed down on a cross for you and for me. Why? Because he loved us. And he wanted to give us freedom. He wanted to grant to us freedom. The freedom to be free. Now there's two kinds of freedom. There's a freedom that you often hear about in the world, which is like being able to do whatever you want to do. Like that's what real freedom is. But there's another kind of freedom. And I want to illustrate this with another story from World War II. So when uh, uh, the the Soviet Union and the uh, Allies were closing in on Germany, as they were closing in, they began to liberate the concentration camps. And when the Soviet Union would liberate a concentration camp, they would open up the camp, obviously horrified by what was going on, and they would say, hey, you're free to go. And of course, they were looked back at by the prisoners and being like, free to go where? Everything we have was taken from us. Free to do what? Most of us are malnourished, we're sick, some of us can barely stand. Free to go where and do what? And the Soviet response was essentially, you figure it out, we're driving on to Berlin. So they were free. They were set free to leave the camp. Now on the other side, on the Western Front, and the Americans, the British, the French, they would set a camp free. They wouldn't let them leave. They would typically keep them in the camp so they could provide food and water and nourishment and medical attention until they were strong enough then to go out and be free. So let me ask you this, which one was being free? Which, one, which group was more free? Let me ask you this, if you were in that situation, which group would you rather be a part of? Who do you want liberating you? So many times we hear freedom is being able to do what you want, and it's not. This is a better freedom. The freedom of the gospel is, is freedom that gives you power and protection and provision, and Christ cares for you. And no, you can't do whatever you want when you give your life to Christ. But that's not real freedom anyway. Real freedom is knowing that the victory has been won by a God that loves you and giving your life to him and then letting him redefine your life. Real freedom is then being able to go into community and you can be vulnerable. You can open up to people because you're not worried about criticism. You're not worried about that. What you're worried about is being known and knowing other people, receiving encouragement, So if you're afraid of community, let Christ lay that aside. Go try a connect group. Try a small group. You now have the freedom to be sent, to go out, to let the gospel shape how you 
how you serve, how you spend your time. This week's message was entitled, Freedom to Obey. I think it's a hard thing to figure out, freedom to obey. But every single one of us needs to respond to the gospel. Responding is obeying. That's, how you, that's what obedience is, it's responding. When I call out my, my children and I say, come here, and they come here, that's obedience, but they responded first. God is calling to you. He's asking you to do something. Maybe it's to, to, to join our church, maybe it's to, to get baptized, maybe it's to, to come to know him for the first time, but he's calling to you. Will you respond? Will you give him whatever it is he's asking for? Mitsuo Fushida had every single reason to be bitter and to write. He could have made a very lucrative career writing about his experiences and continuing to fight the war. Many still did. But he gave his life to Christ. What do you have to let go of? Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Thank you that we can look back into the traditions of our fathers and we can see people like Paul and we can see people like Mitsuo Fushida and we can see this woman whose name we don't know who loved so well in the midst of so much pain and loss. And it changes the world. Lord God, I pray that in your grace, you would set us free from the shackles that we don't even know we have, Lord. I pray that you would take pity on us, that you would have mercy, and you would open our eyes to see how much we try to run with chains on our feet, and we wonder why we trip up and why we fall. Lord Jesus, by your grace, set us free. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen.